Hi, everyone, and welcome again to another one of my Gaudi Mitzvah 22.com podcast on Podbean and Apple and Spotify, as well as it's also a YouTube video, even though YouTube is the Antichrist, but nevertheless, they're about the only game in town. So I do use them. Uh, anyway, I'm very, very excited today. Um, I, we have two guests today that, that have never been on the show before. And the reason for today's show, and I'm going to introduce each guest in a minute, is that I have lately fall, fallen in love with the writings of, of due to this little book here that I recommend everybody get, The Dazzling Light of God, a, Med a Madeleine Delbreau reader. Uh, and a lot of people don't know who she is. She was a French woman born in 1904. We'll get to that in a minute. Uh, and I've been citing little excerpts from her in various articles I've written for publication, as well as on my blog. And then somebody said, oh, you need to do a podcast on this. So we've got the two world experts on Madeleine Del Braille here today. And uh, ladies first, we're going to begin with uh, Colleen, Colleen Dully. And I'm just going to read what I printed off on the interwebs. So okay. if there's anything on the interwebs, which it's not likely is wrong, uh, <laughs> then you can you can correct. All right. That sounds great. Colleen is a multimedia journalist covering Catholic and Vatican news in her current position as associate editor at America Media. Colleen writes and edits Vatican news and analysis pieces and hosts and produces the weekly news podcast Inside the Vatican. Her forthcoming book, Struck Down, Not Destroyed, on the spiritual crises that result from reporting on the endemic problems of the Catholic Church, will be published by Penguin Random House in July 2025. I like that. The endemic problems of the Catholic mm, Church. It was my editor's word. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Colleen is available for speaking and media appearances. That's important. Having appeared on BBC, Radio 4, CBC, Radio 1, MSNBC, and ABC 7 New York, among others. Uh, We're getting the long go, version of the bio here. That's right. <laughs> uh, she's Okay, she's reported on national, international news for Catholic News Service, Associated Press, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. She's her, her work has earned regional and national accolades from the Catholic Press Association, the Society of Professional Journalists and the Louisiana, Mississippi Associated Press Media Editors. She was the 2019 and 2021 Catholic Media Association Multi Multimedia Journalist of the Year. Colleen, that means you're officially a superstar, a oh, superstar. Lord. Yeah, I'll so try to live up to it. We have a superstar of the show. The other uh, the other guest today is Thomas. Why Jacobi. Have to go first? No. The, the other the other <laughs> non superstar. Right. The other guest who is also a superstar superstar has worked at Ignatius Press as assistant editor since July 2018. His responsibilities include developmental editing, project management, translation, acquisitions, and on special occasions, playing dueling banjos and guitars for bishops. That's that's. That's quite an accomplishment. I must say, too, I worked with uh, Thomas for uh, the publication of my book uh, from Ignatius Press, Confession of a Catholic Worker. And so those of you who bought it and hated it, you can blame him. He's totally responsible for every bad thing in the book, I think. Yeah. Uh, grew up in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, went to LSU, uh, Tulane Law School. He was assistant at, Tula uh, at the Tulane Law School. Uh, as a Catholic working in the publishing industry, a job at Ignatius Press had always been, according to this little bio, the white whale for Thomas, <laughs> the white whale. You That's great. It. All right. So in other words, you are at your your dream job uh, while living in Rome. Thomas met some of the Ignatius Press staff who hired him in 2018, invited him to San Francisco not long after moving. Uh, he would encounter a painter and musician named Jacqueline with whom he fell in love at first sight. And the reason why I'm reading that is because I fell in love at first sight with my wife, too. That's a long story. Yes. We were interviewing her for, for a job at DeSales University. She walked down the hallway. And as soon as I saw her, I said to myself, I'm going to marry her. I have no idea. I was not looking That's to awesome. get married, not mm -hmm. looking to get married. And I, I, I did marry her anyway. There we go. That's that's enough biography. But I wanted my uh, readers, I don't normally read uh, biographies that long, but I think that it's important for the viewers and listeners to understand uh, who we're dealing with here today. So anyway, uh, Madeline Dobrell, not a whole lot of people know a lot about her. So I, I want to begin with just a, a basic discussion of her biography. 
uh, for two reasons. Number one, so that people just get a sense of who she was, when she lived, what she did, so on. But also because her biography is actually important. It says a lot about who she is. So we're going to begin with Colleen uh, to discuss the biography of Madeline Del Brell. So Colleen, take it away. Sure thing. And uh, I think I should mention, just so your listeners know, that Tom and I go way back. We actually first read Madeline Delbrell together in college in New Orleans a it's long true. time ago. It's true. Uh, so wow. if I get anything wrong, you can correct me. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, so Madeline Delbrell is born in uh, Musidon, France. Uh, she was born October 24th, 1904. And it's important to know that the time that she's born into is... A period in France where there's a lot of um, kind of anti-Catholic legislation happening. There's a lot of this laïcité going into effect. Um, France, just before she was born, for example, severed their diplomatic diplomatic relations with the Holy See. So kind of that's the environment she's born into. Uh, she is born into a, at least culturally Catholic family. Her mom's quite devout. Her dad is an atheist and she gets most of her intellectual formation from her dad. She has a very uh, non-traditional education. Uh, I think in one book, at least, it's been described as anarchistic. Um, she worked with a lot of tutors. They, Her parents thought she was a piano prodigy. So she spent a lot of hours, most days playing the piano. Um, and she moved around a ton, so not a lot of consistency in her life either because her dad worked for uh, the French Railroad, and so he was moved from station to station until eventually, uh, I believe just, just at the end of World War I, uh, her dad is moved to Paris. Uh, and so she grows up there, and one of her first like really formative experiences as I think like a 14-year-old uh, is that, no, I guess that doesn't work with the timeline. Anyway, one of her formative experiences is seeing uh, World War I soldiers coming home through the train station and, you know, offering them help and so on. Um, yeah, by the time she is like 17, she is a staunch atheist. Her dad was always hanging out with these uh, French intellectuals who were agnostic or atheist, and it was a really strong part of their philosophy. And so she, you know having this sort of prodigy label on her uh, really engaged in those conversations. Hey, I, I, I want to interrupt you real quick. Yeah. I mean, her dad was essentially what, like a manager at, at a train station. Yep. Yeah. Right. Yep. And yet very French autodidact, free thinker, poet, yep. bohemian dude. So yeah. this is a very interesting guy, a blue collar, sort of a blue collar dude, but with a white collar head and, yeah. and a sort of Marxist heart and so on. Yeah. Very interesting. So she had a very interesting father. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, he just continues to be interesting. He causes her a lot of heartache down the line. Um, so in between the wars, uh, she starts to make these friends uh, who she realizes, she says at one point, were known less stupid or interesting than me, something like that, but who were all Christians. And she comes to respect this a little bit more, even though she herself has just written a manifesto at age 17 called God is Dead, Long Live Death, which, you know, really speaks to how... Uh, Death is of, doing quite well, yes. Yeah, how melodramatic she was, how serious she was as a teenager. Um, very, very much 17 years old. Very much. Oh, gosh. We totally would have written that when we were 17. <laughs> something something that dramatic. Um, yeah, so she starts hanging out with these Christians, realizes she can sort of respect them, and ends up falling in love with this guy, Jean. Um, and just before her 18th or 19th birthday, there's different accounts of the years, uh, she has this birthday party where she's dressed in like a Greek robe and it's a costume party because her birthday is, yeah, uh, it's a it's a costume party. She's dressed like a Greek goddess and they dance all night and everyone talks about how in love they looked. And like a month later, Jean goes off to the military and writes Madeline a letter saying, sorry, we're not together anymore. I'm going to be a Dominican. So that breaks Madeline's heart. Those and stupid kind of... Dominicans are always screwing everything up, aren't they? <laughs> I mean, I work for the Jesuits, so I'm not going to comment. <laughs> I have a lot of Dominican friends. I just say that to needle them a bit. Go ahead. So, um, yeah, so this kind of throws Madeline into a tailspin. At the same time, her parents' marriage starts crumbling. Her dad, like, starts losing his eyesight and 
I sleeps with some other lady and gets syphilis, but then it gets misdiagnosed as something else. It, anyway, the everything basically goes up in flames in her life all at once. And so during this time, as one does in times of crisis, she starts looking for the deeper meanings in life. And remember, she has just written this thing that is all about how meaningless life is. Um, and we don't know a lot about exactly how her conversion or reversion came about. Um, the only writings of hers that that survive from that time are poems. And so it's it's sort of tough to to lay out exactly what the trajectory was. But basically, as the title of the book that uh, enticed you to invite us on today says, she was dazzled by God. It's the word that she uses. Um, so that's 1924. Um, she really, she puts a very precise date on that. Uh, Can I interrupt and... for just one second with one? Just yeah, one please, please. It's just that, uh, I think interestingly, so Jean, uh, when they were together, uh, he had actually, he had sort of taught her, he had tried to encourage her to start praying, yeah. you know, and I think, and she was a little hesitant at first, but in the first, I, the, she remembers this moment of just falling on her knees and actually opening up to God. And she said that it was like this flood of uh of grace she felt she felt immediately assured of god's love essentially like this is this is real you know yeah and so it's really it's thanks to this it's really thanks to this this man who eventually became a really prominent dominican theologian as the years mm -hmm. went on uh that she uh, she had this initial conversion that would deepen that would, that would eventually deepen yeah. and Go actually ahead. i just realized that i messed up the timeline a bit she meets that that christian group after she has this conversion experience um so this was part of the deepening so it, it was very much thanks to jean um yeah anyway she basically spends a few years considering a vocation to the carmelites uh decides not to do that because she needs to help her mom take care of her dad um and she gets involved in scouting she's presenting to you know different scout groups uh on the message of the gospel how to live it in your life um and after Oh, and then she uh, she earns her degree in social work. She says, just in case. Uh, <laughs> and then about 10 years after her conversion, she finally finds the thing that, you know, she's best known for in life, which is uh, moving to Ivry, which is this uh, little neighborhood of France that was basically the head of the Communist Party of France. And um, for my she... non-French speaking viewers, that is spelled I-V-R-Y, Ivry. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, and she she moves there with a couple others. She was supposed to move there with a lot more, and everybody kind of peeled off last minute. So it's her and two other women, and then under the guidance of this priest, uh, they go and open a house in Ivry, and it's basically to uh, to carry out social programs, right, social services. Um, but just after they get there, World War II comes to France. Uh, and she gets drafted into the communist government of the city uh, to be their social programs coordinator and also to coordinate uh, national like social service programs for all of France. So all of a sudden she's, you know, working in this super communist milieu on uh, the thing that she's just trained for in the last few years, but she's really good at it. Everyone comes to respect her very strongly. She gets a lot done, a lot of uh, yeah, programs, including I have here emergency shelters, soup kitchens, clothing drives, and training programs for social workers and their assistants, and also public health and social programs. So a bunch. And um, yeah. she's so good at this that at the end of the war after liberation, the communists who she's working with in the government um, ask her to stay on as their social programs coordinator. And this kind of throws her into what Jacques Lowe, who what's the founder of the worker priest movement in France and a good friend of hers wrote about her. Um, he says it threw her into a second conversion. Basically she gets to this point where she's like, she's been working alongside these communists and she's like, I, I am on their side in terms of like the human struggle in terms of the struggle for like social justice, but I can't get behind the atheism. I can't get behind the foundational philosophy and so she has to face this question of whether she's going to keep working with them and just kind of keep her religion to herself, or if she's going to go forward on a different path that she has to discern of, you know, focusing more on this foundational theological kind of level. 
And that's what she decides to do. So she she quits her job in the government and basically spends the next, gosh, 20 years writing on um, Catholic communist relations and then also about the missionary role of lay people, which I think is her best stuff. I mean, her her essay, We the Ordinary People of the Streets, is is what Tom and I read back in college. And it just made me fall in love with her so much so that I uh, started working on a book on her, um, which is why I have all this information at hand. Yeah, yeah, and and she does that. She becomes quite a sought after voice in sort of how to interact with communists uh, for Catholics, and she, um, yeah, she she dies at her desk in 1964 at the age of 60. She was always kind of sickly. She never listened to her doctors when they said to rest. So she um, just just what she had a, a brain heart- hemorrhage. A brain hemorrhage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, some people say she fell down on her desk, others next to her desk. But, And sort of poetically, um, she, according to one book, died the exact day that the Second Vatican Council had its first closed-door meeting to discuss this new idea of the missionary role of lay people, which I kind of like that, that poetic. Yeah, justice. it is very poetic. Yeah, yeah. in 1964. The council was going on. All right. What about uh, first? I'm going to back up just one second. And, and Please, I, yeah, sorry. I, I, want, I tried I want to, to give hi- you the as fast as possible, but oh no, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. I want to. I want to say to my viewers and listeners too. I should have said this up front. What? Why? Or why are we talking about her on on my on my podcast? Uh, because my viewers and listeners know, and my blog readers know that one of my central themes is the universal call to holiness the holiness of, of the laity. And therefore, I'm constantly searching after modern versions of sanctity, modern versions of saints, sometimes not even Catholics, like I'm very, very high on Simone Weil as well, uh, from that same basic period of time in France as well. Uh, and, and so that's what kind of struck me about Madeleine Dobrell was that this is, uh, this is she, I think there's there's a quote in the introduction or something of the dazzling light of God book that she didn't she did not seek the new, but the new kind of imposed itself upon her. In other words, she sought Christ and in seeking Christ first, then there was a freshness and a newness to to her approach to things. So that's the first thing I want to say in response. The second thing and I, I always want to reiterate this for many of my viewers, the important role played, especially in Europe, but also in the United States, by Marxist intellectuals cannot be underestimated. It is very, very hard for an average modern, say, Catholic in the United States who just whose image of communism is simply Stalin and Lenin and these guys, Mao Zedong, uh, to understand the attraction that Marxist intellectual theory had on Europe. Basically, you were either a a Catholic intellectual, or you were a Marxist intellectual uh, in, in in Europe at that time, or some variation of a Marxist intellectual. Larry, uh, can I jump in? No, go right ahead. I mean, and this is this is not even just like the you know high society intellectuals, right? Like the reason that the French priests wanted to you know start working in factories is because this trickled down to the the working class, the factory workers. So the big concern, especially around mid century. Uh, in France was that all of these factory workers were were moving away from their traditionally held Catholic faith and were becoming Marxists. There was this phenomenon in France at that time, uh, starting in the 1920s, I think, they called the Red Belt. And so it was you had and it was it was kind of a Soviet. It was actually kind of a Soviet it was Soviet inspired. It's kind of a Soviet plant. They, were, they had direct connections to, to the USSR, but it was uh, the well, gradually the USSR. But the 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 uh, um, basically all the surrounding the suburbs surrounding uh, Paris. Now Paris itself remained, you know, fundamentally. I mean, there was laicite, but it wasn't communist, you know. But the idea was like if we could just surround Paris and we can kind of convert all of these little. All these little tiny towns, these industrial towns mostly, if we can convert all these workers to essentially communism, um, we'll we'll totally surround Paris and then we'll have Paris, you know. And so you can see, I mean, like there, there. I wish I could pull it up on the screen, but we have there. There are like Soviet magazines from like the 1940s that that show a map of like all these red, all these kind of red territories surrounding 
Paris, you know, and uh, it's it's like there's thing. It's only a matter of time before we, before we take Paris too, you know. And it's incredible the hold that uh, it's something I never knew about before I started studying Madeleine Delbrel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and I also would add that it was part and parcel of the concern of the woman that I have devoted my Catholic worker farm to, a Dorothy Day, you know, was very drawn in, in her early life to Marxist uh, political action on behalf of the workers of the United States, which is why she eventually named her paper the, the Catholic Worker. Mm -hmm. Because like Madeleine Del Brel, she was still very, she had many Marxist friends and was still drawn to their devotion to the poor, but understood she could not embrace their atheism or their materialism or their vision of history or their anthropology or any of those things. But she wanted to co-opt the use of the word worker, mm -hmm. uh, in this case, in the name of, of, of Catholicism. And so I, I see a great similarity between Dorothy Day and, and, and Madeleine Delbrell in this regard as well. Yeah, you're far uh, from the only one. I remember when she was uh, beatified, I wrote an article called uh, Who is Madeleine Delbrell, the French Dorothy Day who Pope Francis beatified this weekend or whatever. Oh, wait, not beatified. It was earlier on. Yeah. Anyway. So you mentioned, uh, Colleen, that you were you were working on a book on Madeleine. De was it published? No, it wasn't. Uh, I started writing it during the COVID pandemic and then life got in the way. I got married in 2020. We just had a oh. baby last year. So uh, eventually the publisher decided to discontinue the series that it was supposed to be part of. So if anybody's looking, <laughs> Tommy. Uh. Hey, Tom, <laughs> there we go. We can always use another book on Madeline. And by Did the way, there are there are other books out there. Now, I just uh, Tom, right, we were off camera. I just went to my phone and order one off Amazon. Which one? Yeah. From Ignatius <laughs> Press. Here it the is. The Holiness of Ordinary People. And I wish I to be. I heard of that one. The yeah, Holiness of Ordinary People. I, yeah. I recommend everybody buy it. The Holiness of Ordinary Thank People. You. That's great because there's very little in English on her. Um, there's yeah, a really good little. translation of We the Ordinary People of the Streets. And actually, if you're just looking to like get an introduction to her, Jacques Lowe's intro to that book is like the best biographical sketch that I've ever seen of her. But most yeah. other things on her are in French. There's okay. one guy who self published a book. That's it. Can I, uh... All right. Well, Thomas, I want to come to you uh, now. I mean, we, uh, do you have first off, do you have anything that you would like to add well, to, I, to Colleen's biography? To add, Go ahead. Biograph biographically, there's not. I mean, that was a great that was a great overview. So there's nothing I would add. But the um, what one thing I wanted to add, I wanted to just read you guys. Um, this is a little excerpt from the the, the Dicastery for the Causes of Saints. Uh, so Madeline was declared venerable by Pope Francis in 2018. Venerable, that's now, what venerable Madeline Delbro. So, um, and uh, here's a little thumbnail sketch that it's, it's the official thumbnail sketch that, that the Dicastery gave in 2018. It's still on their site. Uh, I'll just read it. I'll just read the whole thing. It's just about a paragraph. So it says, that, and it, it gives a good summary of what her spiritually, what her mission was, and why she matters today. It says Madeline Delbro lived out her conversion as an ongoing discovery of God, to whom she wholly clung through the work of grace. Through society's ideological transformations, because uh, she would live through World War I, World War II, this, this red belt, she was a witness to the love of Christ. After the war, World War II, she resisted the systems of power that stood behind the grave new social problems of the day, countering these with Christian principles. The venerable servant of God was capable of a universal love that embraced all. This is why she became a missionary in her own land. And that's a common, that's, Madeline just describes herself as a missionary in her own land, a missionary without a boat. That's, that's, her, that's her kind of catchphrase. After conversion, everything in her tended toward union with God. She experienced the Eucharist as the gift of Jesus's love to which one had to respond all day long. The word of God illuminated all her decisions. Her charity, lucid and intelligent, was without borders and without bounds. She did not do exceptional deeds, but was a living sign of the presence of Christ among men. And with her witness, she taught that the site where God places us must become the site of our holiness. And I think that this brings out uh, at least three key elements of Madeline Delbrell's kind of charism in her mission is that one, she very much believed in, well, the centrality sort of seems obvious of love, love of neighbor. And so for her, even her interfacing with, with communism, 
she didn't think that communism and Christianity were, were com compatible at all, in a sense. Uh, ideologically, since they're fundamentally opposed because Christianity wants to spread to the ends of the earth. It wants to spread, well, communism wants the same thing. <laughs> And you know, Marxism wants to erase, you know, it wants to erase Christ's message in a sense. So they're fundamentally opposed. But the Christian is called to love, love the communist as neighbor because they're literally, she was literally living next door to communists. So they the the way that we interface with them is to always be through just a simple love of neighbor, love of the, the human being created in the image of God. But two, uh the importance of everyday life, lived Christianity in the everyday, in the tiny little moments. Like she uses her, one of her famous images is the key gets stuck in the lock or the, 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 the bus window is rattling next to our ears. Are we going to despair and get angry or are we going to obey reality that, that God is giving us? She says that these tiny little moments, like whatever the tea kettle, you know, the, the tea kettle's broken or whatever. Um, that's actually, Madeline sees that as a call, as an invitation from God to say yes to him and participate in his little, in a joke that he's kind of making with us, you know. And, she refers to those things as our, uh, our religious uh, superiors. Yeah, and I need to listen to that. Uh, I, do, I do well with big things, you know, like... Uh, uh, I smash up my car in a fender bender. I think, well, okay, well, things right. happen. But then, you know, I'll be cooking and I'll drop a fork on the floor and every expletive will fly out of my mouth and, and I'll scream bloody murder at the heavens as to the grand injustice of the fact that I don't have to bend over and pick the fork off the floor. And, and you know, and this is when you were talking about Madeline just now, it's just like, yes, I need a good dose of that right there because I rebel against reality all the time. And those daily little inconvenience my poor long suffering wife has to listen to me rant and rave about the tiniest. I even I even blather on about how horrible the weather is, as if there's somebody in charge of that. <laughs> like somebody should do something about this. <laughs> Just submit a complaint. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, I'm, I think we're I'm, submitting I'm, Carmina's cause for canonization. Yes. Yes, <laughs> we are. Believe me. She, she Tom, should what be was a, point number three. Oh, point yeah, go three. ahead. No, point number three. Thanks for, thanks for asking. Thanks for, thank you, Colleen, for guiding the interview back to where it needs <laughs> sorry, to be. Sorry, sorry. I'm but too I used was to just hosting. I just was reminded of dropping a fork when I was cooking yesterday and screaming at the heavens, and it just struck me. But anyway, yeah, go PT, ahead, Tom. PTSD, Larry. It's PTSD. So I think uh, the I think what she calls bicycle spirituality, uh, which sounds kind of corny in a way, but the idea is that... Um, just like a bicycle only stays upright when it's in motion, when it's moving forward. So too, uh, Christians need to always kind of be not pushing forward in this Marxist sense of historical progress, just progress, 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 and then eventually we'll reach this sort of perfect synthesis. But we need to always kind of be putting putting the gospel in action. We need to, all, in, in the tiniest little ways, we need to, and even if it's just like a five minutes of prayer on, on the bus, she likes to talk about the bus. She loves public transportation. She is, for her, it's like, you, you got motion. <laughs> you got motion. You've got contact with 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 a weird mix of people all around you who would never come into contact with in other circumstances. Um, so for her, action and movement in, in tiny ways, uh, not necessarily social reform, but like literally um, uh, calling a friend, you know, or calling somebody who, to her, the poor were. Uh, she thought that we put too much emphasis on on being economically poor, but she said the poor in our own day are really there are many things the lonely people who are poor in gifts maybe uh they've just sort of been forgotten by or maybe they're poor in looks or something like that you know reaching out to the poor uh in very very simple ways and so she says christianity needs to always be in action otherwise it falls it falls flat you know and i think that that's really fundamental to her and interestingly i mean she grew up when she lived in paris uh with her parents their house was literally attached to the train station so she was just mm -hmm. constantly hearing like the the thrum of trains all day long. I think motion was very much a part of her, of her, uh, of her experience of, of daily life. And in a way, I think that she tried to baptize that once she came back to the church. So. Very interesting. Uh, the, the, so, um, the, the, you called her a missionary. What well, she calls herself a missionary without a boat. Yeah. And and that that intrigues me and it strikes me. I had a guest on Father Todd Libin. Uh, Tottleben, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, a Dominican uh, studying at the Angelica. I had a, he was on a couple of weeks ago and he made the statement, I believe it was Father Father Peter, who said that there's no such thing. And this is an exaggeration. He knows it, but I, I quote it here. He says, there's no such thing 
any longer of a cradle Catholic. Every Catholic mm -hmm. is a convert. Uh, even if you were baptized as a baby, as a Catholic, at some, you are going to be a, a, a revert, whatever you want to call it, or a convert of some kind. That speaks to, to one of my central themes, which is uh, something, you know, that Joseph Ratzinger was rattling away at you know, as early as 1958, you know, the, the de facto atheism in the church, the, the kind of boredom in the church that Bernanos was describing in Diary of a Country Priest already in 1937. Uh, and, and therefore, the need for the church, I think, to recognize a sort of re-evangelizing of the people in the pews, and therefore modern sanctity has got to take the form of saints who understand this as well. So I'd like you guys maybe to, what in Madeline's life sort of evinces that, that sort of concern with in, in a sense, understanding that we live in an era of deep disbelief, even among the believers. Go ahead, Colleen. Oh, don't throw me <laughs> under the bus, man. Uh, well, anyway, well, I don't mean to throw people, no, you know, put people on the spot, but... Uh... Yeah. Um, well, I can definitely... So this, this, this concept of the missionary without a boat, she has this wonderful essay that, that was just published in the book that's available for only 1795. So it's a, the missionaries, with, uh, no, sorry, it's a holiness of ordinary, ordinary people, Madeline Delbrell, just came out about last month, Ignatius Press. Um, but this, this essay is in this book and it's sort of one of her classics uh, by many accounts written in 1943. So during World War II, um, she uses this image. He talks about what, she has this idea of social countries. So that the idea is that even when the single city, there are multiple continents, people can be continents apart within a, even on the same bus, always the buses right. are coming up. Um, I'll read you a little excerpt here that I, I, I looked at last night and I thought it was helpful. She said, we thought that all countries were labeled on maps and that the black lines of railroads and ocean liners were adequate for going from one to another. Living among men, we have learned the opposite. Well, there are maps that show extension. Those that show layers are also needed. People are classed one above the other like geological strata. We walk together on the sidewalk. We come from two different worlds. Side by side at a bus stop, this tattooed man and this proper little lady are as far apart as two continents. <laughs> In the neighborhood, walls and walls, a world of factories. In the subway aisles, famous people, champions, stars. Worlds of stars who, when we approach them, disintegrate into a powder of worlds. In the train to the suburbs are a half a dozen girls and boys. They pile together on three seats and make a beautiful racket, a country unto itself, and better protected than China by its wall. And her idea here is that um, the Christian life, if to be a disciple of Christ means fundamentally, even if we stay exactly where we are, we are always going out. We're always in the process of going out. Um, and that means that means taking the road toward uh, toward this other, toward people who live in different worlds. Uh, because she thought that, I mean, she lived in uh, a fundamentally atheist city because it was, it was communist by kind of by definition. It was run, it was run by communists anyway. Um, that uh, you could be, you could live in a, in a, quote unquote Christian nation, and this is an obvious fact, you can live in a quote unquote Christian nation and uh, be in a totally kind of, in a, in a milieu that's totally forgotten God. And she thought that the worst poverty of all, I think Mother Teresa said this too, but that was uh, that of those who had forgotten God and were felt utterly alone in the universe. And so she thought that the church was always called um, to, to, be, to be crossing the boundaries into these, into these little worlds that are literally people living right next door to each other. It's, it's like a world a godless world. Uh, so um, you need to be crossing into the and, and, and bringing God, not necessarily uh, through literally reading to them the gospel or get, presenting the charisma or something like that, but literally by incarnating the church, uh, by receiving the Eucharist and incarnating the church in their presence and just sort of bringing to them some small act of mercy. She thought that that was the best face of uh, that was what that's what Christians in the church are called to do to kind of to go to receive the Eucharist to just to go and kind of be with people and bring uh, that kind of love that we can only that we sort of radiate when we receive uh, when we receive God's love. So I know it sounds a little bit abstract, but I, I, this idea of crossing boundaries 
um, even within, like if you're on the train with somebody, you know, you're, you're crossing into another universe sometimes by talking to the person next to you, you know, you, you live in totally different universes. And this is, this is what she saw as her mission uh, right there in France, uh, to be right there in France. She was in this totally atheist milieu, but she, and she was one of the only believers. And she knew that she had to just believe in their presence and that that would somehow, there was sense to goodness that came from that. And that would sort of, that would be the first step. You know? mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also probably worth mentioning. I mean, one, that she's a poet. It comes out clearly in, in your writing, or in her writing. Um, but two, that this was a time, I mean, when she moves into there's at least one account that i've read that said um you know the the catholic and atheist kids were throwing rocks at each other the catholics mm -hmm. wouldn't go to businesses operated by communists and communists wouldn't let catholics into their businesses it was a totally segregated society and so yeah the way that madeline comes in and there's a famous story of her there's a a, a communist brother whose sister becomes a Catholic nun, and she brings them together. She's able to reconcile their relationship, and in fact, the three of them start a bakery together that financially failed, but you know, it succeeded in its mission of uh, of crossing yeah. that boundary. Yeah. I think that's important for people to understand too. Um, given those given those times, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of the great theological debates that took place amongst the French Dominicans and Jesuits and so forth. People like mm -hmm. Gary Goulagarage versus Jean Daniel Lou and Henry de Lubac, that the, the the politics of France France got mixed up in that. Deb. I mean, the, the the memory of 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 monarchy and Catholic France was still strong in in Catholic circles at that time. It was still a very kind of reactionary political sense among restorationist Catholics at that time. And Gary Goulagrange was part of the La, La Action Francaise was about, mm -hmm. in a sense, restoring the confessional state, restoring Catholic France so much. So, in fact, that's why Lagrange was partial to sympathetic with uh, Marshal Pétain and the Vichy government, not because he was pro Nazi, but because he he hoped that they would restore, you know, the kind of Catholic monarchic sort of sense of things, whereas de Lubac was part of Catholic Catholic action, which mm -hmm. was much more along the lines of what Madeleine Delbrell. That's that's what jogged my uh, just being a kind of leavening presence within society. And I think de Lubac and his confreres, along with Delbrell, had a better sense of where French society was mm -hmm. uh, and that in order to overcome this dynamic, this binary of you're our enemy and we are opposed to you, some different kind of evangelization, some different kind of presence had to take place, mm -hmm. you know, and I don't I mean, what were do you guys know what what was mad? Did Madeline have a politics? What if she had a politics? What was her politics? I have this um, this passage from the Jacques Lowe introduction. I reread this over breakfast this morning. That's why I'm quoting so much from it, but I also do think it's that good. Uh, he says, to the end, she remained tied to the issue of the day, whether it was the most private or the most public issue. She experienced the alternating joys, sufferings, and risks that come from throwing oneself wholeheartedly into these issues or becoming at turns discouraged by them. This is an area which it is difficult to maintain a balance in which partial truths are almost always the most dangerous. The salvation of the world and happiness, humankind and each individual human being, collective works and direct contacts, material aid and the proclamation of the gospel, bodily suffering and spiritual suffering, Madeline tirelessly sought out the correct vantage point from which the whole could be seen. So I, she was, I think that she maintained a very, um, like, unlike Dorothy Day, who was uh, really believed in this kind of... Um, she she wouldn't have been an advocate of like big government, right? I think right. Madeline, on the other hand, saw that the government had an important role to play in in social programs, and I mean, worked as part of that government. Um, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it seems seems from Jacques Lowe that she that she was really kind of into the the issue of the day, whatever was the the popular thing. Um, but always with this view towards. Yeah, I, I don't think that she had that that Marxist materialism, right? It was much more in line with Dorothy's sort of personalism and in, in the fact that she wanted to be serving people, be using her life as like an instrument 
supposed to communicate God, but to communicate God by being of service to others. That's how I yeah. would summarize it. Now, she also started like a group of women to aid her in her work there in the yeah, event. The tell us a little tell us a little bit about that. Oh, uh, I'm not the expert on this, so Tom, if you want to take the lead. Oh. <laughs> okay. well, I don't know much about it either. Just what I read in the in the little bi biography yeah. at the beginning. Well, of they're reading. still they're still around. Uh, but yeah, basically I, my sense was that they all had some training in social services, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And um yeah, and that they were working in social service jobs a variety of them uh it was never like a centralized thing as far as i remember yeah. but i'm i'm getting to the end of my knowledge now yeah that's that's my understanding too so when she was colleen mentioned that when the after her conversion you know through the through the influence of this priest um through a local parish priest she she was encouraged to join the scout this kind of european scout movement which is pretty young at that time and it's similar to kind of Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts here, but with a more specifically Catholic flair to it, where they would literally study, I think they would study scripture, they would go to mass together. So mm -hmm. there was like a, a Catholic yeah. element. And she kind of learned, she sort of taught herself uh, the faith. She would study, she would have studied the French equivalent, basically, like, a, like the, basically the Baltimore catechism at the time, she would cat, kind of self-catechize, learned how to, learned how to evangelize kids. And uh, during this year of service as a scout leader, she encountered uh, a couple of other young women, I think two other young women who had this sense of like, God wants me to do something, but I don't know what it is. He wants me to do something radical, be, belong to him, but I don't know how to do it. And then Madeline gets out and um, she discerns, like Colleen mentioned, she discerns uh, religious life for a while. She wants to be a Carmelite, but there's something in her. One, she feels like she needs to help take care of her parents who are, uh, their marriage is exploding. Her dad's super sick. Um, uh, but also, I think she sensed that she needed to be in the world uh, for more, I think, for more theological reasons. Or that, that was mm -hmm. her, she, that was her distinct charism that she sensed. And then these two other, these two other young women she met while a scout leader, they had the same, they had the same call. And then they got together. So Madeline actually studied nursing too, got a nursing certificate, then also studied social work, got a social work certificate. And then uh, she and these other two young women, um, they, got together and they started to be basically consecrated lay women. Um, mm -hmm. they, I don't think they had, I don't know if they made a vow. I don't know what their vows were. I don't know. They were like what, informal vows, if I remember correctly. Got poverty, yeah. chastity, and obedience within the world. So I don't know if they would be obedient to a bishop or what, but they, they were going to basically live quietly as religious lay women. Um, mm -hmm. because, and that's very key to Madeline's whole spirituality I and mean, if you read an essay like we the ordinary people of the streets there's the sense that god can call you to be there in the mix and mm -hmm. like you know in the thrum of like of the paris city streets you know and be a le to be leaven in the dough but she that was her sense uh of her own vocation and she led and she led a community that grew to i don't know how many people colleen i mean uh, uh i don't remember i can say on the obedience thing they started with the idea of being like obedient under the under the like you know auspices of the parish priest of, of the parish that their house abutted and that quickly fell apart because the parish priest's kind of idea of what they were supposed to be doing was things like cleaning the parish hall and stuff like that <laughs> and uh she was like this is not what we're here for and so they oh, God. discerned away from that uh i think after that they got a letter from the bishop i'm not sure though so you, you you answered kind of one of my questions. You said the house abutted this parish. So they did live kind of in common with one another? In yeah, they lived of, in the same house. Yeah. They lived in the same house. So it was a kind of real community. What strikes mm -hmm. me is that it seems strikingly similar to what we would call a secular institute. And yes. yeah. just maybe without all the formal parameters and canonical procedures associated with it. There actually was a question of whether they were going to become uh, an instituted lay institute uh after that became a, a canonical reality and they decided not to i don't remember what reason they gave though yeah and so were so these were all women living in community with one another and and working in the world while committing themselves to obviously a, a communal life of some kind of prayer and spirituality and discernment and theological thinking and reading and so on um but they're all none of them are married uh, and so the question that I would have, and toss it to both of you, 
because uh, I get this all the time. There, this is the, I just gave a talk in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Wonderful, wonderful people. It's a beautiful cathedral in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, St. Joseph's Cathedral. Wonderful people that sponsored me to come out there. I gave a talk and I got to the end of my talk and it was very well received. But I got the same question that I always get. Well, what does this look like if you're married and have five kids and as one of my former students said to me, how am I supposed to live like Dorothy Day if I have five kids in a golden doodle? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I even wrote a blog post called Five Kids in a Golden Doodle. Those are my former students, Tom and Natalie Lelio. Uh, great people live in Florida now. But it's it, it's it's a common question. It's a real question, which is um, how does this version of sanctity that Madeline Del Brell is writing about here how does it translate uh, into the life of a married person with children? I think the answer is probably somewhere in the area of what we were talking about before of just finding God in the ordinary yeah. things of life. Go ahead, Colleen. I would say so. Um, I mean, I think you're going to get one answer from us since Tom and I are both married with one baby each. Um, but yeah. yeah, one of my favorite passages from Madeline is she's talking about uh it's again that she's drawing this distinction between, you know, people who are lay people stay in the world and um, missionaries, missionaries who have taken some sort of religious vow. Um, she, you know, kind of draws the contrast between like they're wearing habits, we're wearing normal clothes, whatever. Uh, but at one point she talks about how the missionary goes out and stands at the top of like a desert dune and looks out at all of the unbaptized land that they're going to uh, going to baptize. And we stand, she says, we, the ordinary people of the streets, stand at the top of a crowded subway staircase, looking down at all of the people who need God's love so badly. And then she goes into this beautiful sort of poetic litany. Her style is really reminiscent of like uh, Charles Piggy's, if you've read him. Um, oh, yeah. Says, I love Piggy. Yeah. And, uh, there are residences of like Piggy that. throughout. Yes. Yeah. But she's like, um, she goes into this kind of yeah mystical prayer almost where she's like you know she's sitting on the subway she's like lord give me your uh your hands to help this person up give me you know your voice to say here take my seat to this you know yeah. old person and so on um so to answer your question i i think that it's much easier to translate you know madeline's kind of vision of our role in the world to life with being married and having a kid than it is yeah. to maybe live Dorothy's vision. Um, oh, not yeah. That it's, yeah, not that it's impossible. I mean, I, I know Catholic workers who have kids and it's tough, but they do it. But Madeline's, she's all about kind of reaching out to exactly where you are. I remember when I was pregnant a couple of years ago now, uh, I was really worried about what would happen to like the more contemplative side of my life right my spiritual life right um and something from madeline really helped me which was the section also in we the ordinary people of the streets on uh i think it's on solitude and on silence those two sections if i remember correctly are next to each other but she talks about inside of ourselves carving out a space where like the word of god reverberates like in a cathedral something like that and I remember spending a lot of time when I was pregnant, like trying to get more easily in touch with that, that space of silence and that space of like the echoing of God's word so that I could access that more easily once I had a baby and, and it's worked out, it's worked out pretty well. So far. yeah, I think, yeah, of, I think go ahead, Thomas. I was going to chime in because I, I, I totally agree with Colleen on this point because uh, like I said, I, like Colleen, I'm married, I got a baby and uh, I actually you have a much found... younger baby than me. You're, yeah. in the, you're in the trenches right now. He, uh, I have found myself that... I so call we, that phase the dictatorship of the diaper. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Your whole um, schedule revolves around that stupid changing of the diaper, oh, man, which, which seems to happen every 30 seconds in some kids. But anyway, <laughs> go ahead, Thomas. Go yeah, ahead. I, uh, I think that Madeline's, uh, Madeline's writings, her spirituality, um, it's... it's 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 e it's easier to transpose to the to the married state for one because she's explicitly she explicitly mentions when she gives examples of of how to say yes to the Lord, 
she explicitly gives examples of like whatever my my husband is in a bad mood you know it's like you know am i going to say yes to this or am i just going to kind of cut him off or she gives examples from married life you know she mm -hmm. often she's often using these to illustrate how are the little ways of saying yes and of kind of letting god sort of joke with us and uh and also she gives examples she often makes a point that you know your prayer your daily prayer um can be it, it, it it's about quality rather than quantity. So it can be, a, your, she says that your prayer can be five, she's always talking about transportation, it's five metro stops at the end of the day. She uses that, but for us, it could be a commute or whatever, you know, it could be five minutes driving. That might be literally all we have time for, practically speaking, but she says, but if you're truly, if you, if you really carve, like Colleen used that great image of like hollowing like an echo chamber out within yourself. If you really give that time to the Lord and there's a lot of longing in it, God can do more with those five minutes, the mustard seed. God can do more with those five minutes, whatever those five bus stops, than he could with two hours of kind of, of sort of distracted, half, you know, half-hearted prayer. And uh, and she also says that with regard to like the, the lit liturgy of the hours, she encourages lay people to pray it, but she says, don't pray it. Um, don't expect that you're going to, don't make yourself any promises like, oh, I'm going to pray Compline every single day, or I'm going to pray lauds every single Bingo. day. She's, she says, just like, just dive into it. You might even get cut off halfway through, but it's about the contact. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're having living contact with the body of the church, with the prayer of the church, and you're tapping into that reality. And I, I love that about Madeline, because that's actually not, I mean, somebody like Adrienne von Speyer, who I also love, um, she is less, she's, her theology, she doesn't give many examples from, from married life. And it's very much about like, you have to give absolutely everything surrender everything all the time and that she puts so much stress on that whereas madeline says the same thing your surrender can take the form of tiny little tiny little surrenders though you know mm -hmm. amen amen i mean carrie and i are both benedictine oblates and we we pray liturgy of the hours but uh you know we have to be flexible about it as well you know we don't get locked into oh my god we've just committed a mortal sin since we missed evening prayer because somebody came over to the house and so mm -hmm. on uh, so it doesn't like I liken this kind of spirituality to, you know, the, the practice of the presence of God or uh, of Brother Lawrence or of the little flowers, little little way. Uh, it, you don't have to be on your knees. Oh, Lord, we be sage. They, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, t t I say I, I go to an Anglican ordinary at parish. So uh, it took <laughs> some time for me to get used to the fact that after growing up watching Monty Python spoofing <laughs> Anglicanism with, Oh Lord, we beseech thee uh, to see, to hear that actually prayed. Oh Lord, we beseech thee. I, but it, so that sticks in my brain. Is something the holy hand grenade. Yeah. The Holy hand grenade of Antioch. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, yes, the practice of the presence of God in the simple things of life, being able to, to practice that presence constantly. I also say this, um, you know, I run into priests from time to time and they, we, they confide in me. I just, I'm so busy. My prayer life isn't what it should be. And we, we conclude, of course, if you're too busy to pray, then you're too busy, or you haven't learned to incorporate prayer into your busyness. But I say the same thing to married people. I don't care how many kids you have and your job and so forth. If, if those things are too busy for you in order to pray, then you're too busy. Uh, and you have you have to carve something out in your life so that there is a spiritual core. Now, that might be just like you said, Thomas, just little five minute snippets here and there, you know, half a rosary or half a decade or half of a Hail Mary, <laughs> you know, <laughs> pare it down to, you know, to its bare minimum. Anyway, I'm I'm ranting and raving now about these things. I wanted, but I wanted to mention ahead. that you, you talked about St. Therese, you know, and I think it's yeah. worth mentioning that. Um, that two of Madeline's sort of uh, her heroes were one uh, Saint Therese of Lisieux, you know, a fellow French woman for one, you know, and Saint Therese was still fairly newly canonized saint when Madeline was sort of getting formed. Um, her little way definitely had a big influence on her. She wanted to be a Carmelite, I think, partly because of Therese, you know, but also uh, who's now he's I don't know if he's been canonized officially as he's supposed to be, but uh, Charles de Foucault, uh, I think he's still oh, blessed yeah. Charles de Foucault. Mm -hmm. Uh, another French missionary, sort of from rough, a little bit before her time, he died in I think the 1910s. Um, but what's interesting is, so I think almost all listeners know Saint Therese in her little way, small actions done with great love, and you can see that everywhere in Madeline. But I think another the really interesting strain in Madeline that I've uh, I've picked up on more recently is that is, is this influence of Charles Foucault, who believed 
So he he was a French priest, kind of sought the road, wanted to be a missionary for a long time, didn't know how to do it, wanted to live a radical life of discipleship, didn't know how to do it. Eventually wound up getting ordained, going to the deserts of Algeria to live among the Tuareg people. And uh, that's where he would ultimately be, actually be essentially martyred. Uh, martyred, yeah. Killed. Um, but his goal there was uh, he knew uh, that he, he actually went into it knowing he wouldn't convert a single one to Christianity. He knew it. He said that these, he says, maybe in 200 years, um, these, these people will be able to convert. You know, an image that I could think of is like, so we have Golden Gate Park here in San Francisco, which was all sand dunes 150 years ago. And they, grad, they had to spend 50 years basically just bringing in dirt, pumping water into it before the land, before the, the, the soil was fertile. And now it's like this incredible, this gorgeous, lush park full of eucalyptus trees, but there was nothing uh, 150 years ago. And, um, and his vision of, of evangelization to these, to the Tuareg was like, they need to see, they're going to need to see first that Christians are good because they see, they see Christians as, as whatever, uh, you know, um, colonialist oppressors, you know, uh, just kind of this, just, just, uh, power hungry scumbags more or less they need to see first that a frenchman a christian can be good and that's step one and that will already be that will already be a crossing an abyss even if no one converts these so he's he envisioned like the long game of evangelization and i think that madeline too living among she was in a similar situation living mm -hmm. among these uh these these communists i think she often stressed that we need the goodness of christ has become uh invisible in us we put we put so much stress maybe on his radical on his radical uh, the radical elements of his love self-sacrificial love which is great or we put a lot of stress on on the liturgy beautiful liturgy and that's great too in its way um but she said that we the face of christ needs to be clearly good to these people he needs they need to see him as good and she stressed that so much uh, not only her own actions i mean one of the most famous photos of, is of her crouching down in front of this little pole this poor polish child just kind of smiling and playing with this kid just an act of basic human goodness that somehow gets imbued uh through madeline it's there's something distinctly christian about that goodness you know and uh goodness can be done with it with a, in a distinctly christian way but then she encouraged also the uh, the members of the women in her community the members of her teams to do the same thing when you're going to, to visit somebody be joyful like be joyful be funny be fun just just be good be a, be a good person because that can actually it's, it, it sounds almost trite but it can easily be forgotten and she wanted because these communists need to see that christians are good they're not just these ideologues like like they actually are right, right. and uh if i can add one more thing to that, that sure i think brings it into kind of the modern day um in oh i'm gonna flub the year sometime in like the early 80s or late 70s uh, Henri de Lubac gave a speech at St. Louis University that oh. I just happened upon in my research. Uh, and he talks about, he did this like series of talks all around the country, trying to address the division that arose in the church after Vatican II, all these different, uh, sometimes very different opinions of how to implement it. Uh, and he says that he thinks there, he spends like, 16 of 17 pages of this talk talking about the division and then on the very very last page or the second to last page he says and i think the person who can give us a guideline for how to navigate and overcome this division is this french woman madeline delbrell and it's i mean it's quite the endorsement but you know we're still we're still living in a time of such polarization and division and i think much like dorothy madeline is somebody who offers um both an invitation and a challenge to people, no matter where they fall on the spectrum. That's high praise coming from someone like De Lubac, who <laughs> quite easily and quite justifiably could have had a rather long enemies list. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Uh, uh, going all the way back to the Nazis, which he resisted in the underground, but then also <laughs> in mm -hmm. the church where he was somewhat silenced. It's mm -hmm. wrong to say that Rome silenced him. They did not. But anyway, he, he had his enemies in, in, in the church, and yet he, he never allowed that to make him bitter. I'm going to uh, come back, though, to Madeline's uh, atheist phase, hmm. uh, because I think one of the one of the reasons that compels her, I mean, I have to back up, you know, the, 
one of the things that compels me is the belief, since I believe so strongly that uh, modern culture is animated by a core set of plausibility structures, as the sociologists call it, that, that are radically unbelieving, that instill within us in, the, in our mother's milk and the ether that we breathe a, a, a basic and fundamental orientation to naturalism and unbelief, uh, that the modern saint has got to be somebody who lives through unbelief, conquers mm -hmm. it, transforms it from within, but still bears those wounds still bears those scars. Uh, it's kind of the idea of the metaxis, the in-between. The saint of today is one who understands that in-betweenness between the supernatural and the natural, heaven and earth, the unbeliever, the believer. And I think, therefore, it's very significant that people like Dorothy Day went through a period of unbelief. Madeleine Delbrell went through a period of extreme unbelief. Uh, Simone Weil went through a period of unbelief. These are all people that that events in their lives, the sanctity of transformed unbelief, I think. I think that comes, do you think that comes through in her writing? I do. Um, I think that there's actually an, an excerpt here from this, this new book, uh, The Holiness of Ordinary People. Um, he, it's an essay called, He Who Follows Me Will Not Walk in Darkness. And it's about the scriptures, reading, reading the scriptures. And she says, um, uh, in order, essentially, in order for the scripture to take root in us, um, she says, it is necessary to have plunged into the ambient death that is the death surrounding us, of that which makes our love human, devastations of time, of universal fragility, of sufferings, decomposition of all values, of human groups, of ourselves. In other words, like the horrible experiences of the 20th century, you can yeah. war. Yeah. Um, it is necessary at the other pole to have felt the universe impenetrable to the security of God, as she had, in order to perceive in ourselves such a horror of darkness that the evangelic light becomes more necessary to us than bread. Only then do we hold tightly to it as to a rope stretched above a double abyss. It is necessary to know that one is lost in order to want to be saved. The one who does not take in his hands the thin book of the gospel with the resolution of a man who has only one hope, can neither decipher it nor receive the message from it. Amen. Yeah. Double is, abyss. Go ahead, that Colleen. That quote came to me like at a very important moment in, in my faith when I was just like at rock bottom. I was like covering the 2018 wave of the abuse scandal and was just like so fed up as an understatement, but and I uh, I went on a retreat with the Jesuit who first introduced me and Tom to um, Madeline, and he gave me a little page with that that quote printed out on it. And I remember being like, oh, oh this is <laughs> this is yeah, exactly what um, I need. Yep. I, I call this the hermeneutics of the abyss. And yeah. and it, it's I think it's terribly important to understand that modern sanctity is a sanctity that teeters over the abyss. Uh, in Joseph Ratzinger's Introduction to Christianity, I end almost all my talks, lectures that I give with this little thing where he, he turns to the writings, the diary of Therese of Lisieux, and he points out her deep temptations to atheism. And, and he points out that essentially her whole spiritual life was a spiritual life lived over the abyss with mm -hmm. no supporting structures below, clinging only to the thin arboreal presence of the cross. Uh, it, it sounds dour and doomsday and oh, oh my God, oh, woe is us, I'm a woman, no man and all that sort of thing. But no, no, it's actually quite thrilling, quite exhilarating when you understand that all of the social props uh, that you've put in place to buttress your faith, though good in their way, can also get in the way. Mm -hmm. uh and, and there i i'm the structure and i don't want, i don't want to dominate the conversation here but the modernity is characterized in, in my, a lot of that i write as that which dissolves i'm reminded of, of the sociologist peter berger who talked about the fact that modernity is that which removes our binding addresses our existential binding addresses it dissolves the essence of the diabolical i mean what's the etymology of the word diabol diabolus it means to throw apart the essence of modernity is dissipation, dissolution, 
to throw things apart, to dissolve things, to get rid of our binding address. So when we say we have to meet people where they are, I think what Madeline Delbrell understood is that people are nowhere. Hmm. When you say meet them where they are, well, where is that? They're no, where is someone who's actually nowhere? And Madeline understood what it felt like to be nowhere. And therefore, what I like to say is that Madeline Delbrell and saints like her, and I think she is a saint, what they give by their Christological focus and that using the cross of Christ as their single metric of holiness, it gives people a binding address. It gives people that point of contact, that binding address. And that's why you said earlier, Thomas, about just sim- and, and you too, Colleen, simply about living, about exuding the joy and the goodness of the goodness of Christ makes people want to say, well, that person seems to have, seems to know who they are. They seem mm-hmm. to have a binding address. There's, there's somebody home there. I'd like to live in that home. Right. I want to see more of that binding address. And, and to me, that, I think that just, that's what struck me, both that quote you just read and almost everything that I've just read of hers. Anyway, mm-hmm. I'm rambling right. now, but. No, I mean, I'm a big believer that that is the way to do this re-evangelizing of, of the world that we've been talking about sort of throughout this conversation. I mean, I just to bring it back to a personal level, like the reason I even care about my Catholicism is that, you know, I, I was close to this one nun who I kind of, I, I just remember seeing her praying one day and she looked so like at peace and so happy. And I was like, I want what she has. What is it? And I, I think that that's, I mean, more than any like argument for the proof of God's existence or whatever. I, right. I think that it's that people are attracted to something beautiful that they see in, in your life and they want to know more. They want to know what's underlying it. That's absolutely right. That's my own, that was my own experience too. I mean, in college, I had a Madeline Delbrell style atheist phase. I was probably a much dumber atheist than she was. I didn't know <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> I, uh, and I just remember, you know, I, I encountering Christians for the first time in college because I, I I was in Louisiana, and so the, actually Christianity is sort of everywhere, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's where that's to be praised in Louisiana. Um, but uh, I remember encountering Christians in my classes, you know, and some of these guys were like weird hipster poet people like me, you know, and uh, and then I encountered specifically Catholics, and I noticed in all these people, it's like you know what they seem to actually love their lives one. And they actually, they're actually really good friends. They don't like talk trash about their friends behind their back like I do, or like my friends do. It's like they were good friends. And they respected, the men respect, actually respected women more than the so-called like, the so-called like atheist feminist guys. Like they actually had much more reverence for, for women. And, uh, and I noticed they were way smarter too than I was. So it was just, it's like these guys have something. And I couldn't deny it. I could see it with my own eyes. You know, I could feel it in my bones. I was like, you know, I don't care if it's, basically I told myself, I, was like, I don't care if it's real or not. Um, I want what they have. Mm-hmm. And then I came to find out that it was, I came to found out that, that it was real. And that's why they were so, they were so capable of standing on their two feet because they knew they were standing on solid ground. Yeah. Absolutely. I, well, you know, it, it, it strikes, and this could just be a prejudice, but it strikes me that true believers of deep intellect are the most intelligent people in the world Mm -hmm. and they're intelligent and i'm not among them but uh that believers of deep intellect trump unbelief of deep intellect Mm -hmm. because unbelief of deep intellect ultimately short circuits itself and it will run up to something profound and stop Mm -hmm. and say well that's above my pay grade. I'm not going there. And that, that sort of short circuits everything. I'm reminded of the philosopher Nicholas Gomez de Vila, who says that if God exists, then prayer is the highest rational act of the human mm-hmm. being. If God exists. Which um, is how battle and how her conversion right. comes apart about. Right. She, she just decides in the midst of this like moment when her life is falling apart to try praying. Yep. that's it she and she she sort of says something similar to what you said tom where she's like you know okay i don't know if it's real but i'm gonna take a gamble i'm gonna try this and and that kicks off this amazing conversion that leads to all the rest yeah, she was no, i mean in, the, go ahead thomas i was gonna say that she's an you what, what's interesting even as an atheist uh she was a very intellectually honest atheist yeah. you know 
And I think that's what led her to her conversion. I mean, so this, there's this famous essay she wrote at age 17, God is dead, long live death. And here's an excerpt from it. She says, it has been said, God is dead. Since it is true, we must have the honesty to live no longer as if he were alive. We settled the question for him. It remains to settle it for ourselves. And uh, she goes on actually to, to, to lambast um, scientists who are under the illusion that they can kill death through, mm -hmm. through, through medical advances or whatever. She's like, no, you haven't killed death. You've just killed the different ways of dying. And like, but the death, well, death is doing just fine is what she said. Yeah. Yeah. And her intellectual, her honesty there uh, is, it almost like makes it inevitable that she's going to, it's like, you know, we're, we're still, we say God is dead, but we don't actually think that's true. It's like, if we're saying it, let's actually live it, you know? Mm -hmm. But of course, when you actually live it, it's not a livable life, you know? And I think that she, she began to perceive that. You know? so. Yeah, the part in God is dead, long live death that really gets me, I guess, especially now that I'm a mom, is um, she, you know, she's just experienced World War One as like a young teenager right, yeah. uh and she talks about the foolishness of people who decide to have kids she's like why why would you do this just because if you know that they're just going to become cannon fodder yeah. wow you know? yeah yeah i mean and and so i mean her intellectual honesty shows how she gets to this point of believing that life is more absurd by the day like if if there's no god this is all meaningless yes yeah i mean it's she, it's honestly shocking that she wasn't suicidal at this point she, well, she had a raw and brutal commitment to reality yes to, to, to the real yep. and i think then like like thomas said it, it, it was almost inevitable that she would since she was a deeply honest atheist seeking reality that she would um, she would either end in suicide and an ultimate tragic end or right. she would she would come out the other side and, mm -hmm. and realize, you know, that reality demands the affirmation of something else. And I think that then is true of the sanctity of the, of the modern saint. I think the modern saint has to be somebody with a, this deep, deep commitment, not to ecclesial ideologies, uh, but to reality, to the, mm -hmm. to the ecclesia, to a phenomenology of what's really going on in faith and belief, to have a jeweler's eye for BS and to be able to cut through BS and, and to call it for what it is, which requires an element of prophetic stance sometimes to, mm -hmm. to say, you know, like Gandalf to the Balrog, that you, you shall not pass, you know, even if it means your own, your own martyrdom, those kinds mm -hmm. of things. I, I, I just, she's just such, I love the title, The Dazzling Light of God of this book, because she's so dazzling. I'm also jealous. I mean, she she starts to pray and then she gets this this almost this road to Damascus moment, it seems like. Right. Where she's flooded with the, you know, I wish I'd have one of those moments. Right. <laughs> I and, find and, it really consoling in her story, though, how after that, it takes her a full 10 years to get where she's supposed to go. <laughs> yeah, it does. You yeah. know, so, yeah, it didn't show up fully formed, but there was no. something something there though it from reading the the biography though it does seem like something very profound happened to her yeah when she started to pray uh and and i think that's that there's a lesson in there somewhere for all of us to to in our prayer to have this and my my guess my guess is that the reason why her prayer had such a powerful effect on her was once again this deep devotion to reality Mm -hmm. How often do our, do our prayers just live on the surface of things? I know mine do just on the surface, on the surface, on the surface. Whereas every once in a while you do, you have a prayer that cuts to the bone, right? That really digs down deep and carves out the tumor. And you mm -hmm. think that hurt, but holy, that, that was one heck of a prayer, you know? And, and I bet, I bet her prayer life was a constant a constant collection of moments like that, at least in her writings. And so I want to, we're, we're sort of kind of running out of time, but I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about one thing. She had this vocation to, to in a sense, live amongst the people, to be a, a sort of pilgrim in the world, but not of the world and so on. You get the picture. But she also believed that writing was a vocation, which I think is something that the three of us and a lot of people listening can, uh, 
can appeal to what would appeal to them. So maybe one or both of you could talk a little bit about how did she view her writing as part a part of her vocational mission. I I'll start. I know Colleen will have a lot to say, so I'll I, let her. Gather. I might I'll not, her. man. Go go for it. I'll, I'll talk and let her gather her thoughts because I'm sure. But um, I think that I read it. I read a passage in one of her biographies. I read. They said of her, that, well, for one, she just wrote constantly. Um, they said that for her, writing was life and life was writing. So she just wrote what she experienced. And as she was experiencing it, she was she was kind of writing it out in her head, not to not to make her famous, to make her a famous poet. She, she, she barely published in her lifetime. She kind of assumed that she just filled notebook after notebook. She was constantly writing. And but it was her way. She was a poet, you know, and poetry was her way of seeing seeing the glory of the world, you know, seeing the glory of God's creation and the glory of the human soul and the glory of God himself, the dazzling light of God. I think she needed poetry and art form as a way of kind of bringing that out. So she was writing constantly and she, she basically died while writing. And apparently if you, if you look at her handwritten manuscripts, you can see her literally falling asleep as she's writing at like two in the morning, you know, she was just constantly writing. And whether she saw it as part of her, her, her mission I don't know. Colleen could speak more to that, I think. But what I do know is that she saw it as fundamental to her way of uh, of experiencing the beauty of reality. Um, she needed poetry. And I've myself, I've always gone back to writing, even if I know I'm not going to publish it, because I right. the practice somehow of trying to write a poem or an essay. It, it challenges me to go much deeper and to make connections. Uh, that I wouldn't make just spontaneously on my own uh, because I'm thinking about where to put different things, um, like how I can use this, how I can use that. I'm like, I look at the world with a different, with more, uh, with more attention to detail, I think. And that's why I love, that's why I personally have loved writing. And I think Mad that's probably the same for Madeline, who was a poet from the time she was a child. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we didn't talk about it much, but she was like a poetry prodigy, even more yeah. than the piano prodigy. I have this book here. La Route. Um, she published this when she was like 18 or so. It, I guess she finished it after her conversion. Um, but it won a national poetry prize in France when she was in her early 20s, I guess, when she won the prize. But yeah, in terms of vocation, I can't remember right now if she wrote anything about writing as vocation. Uh, nothing is coming to mind immediately. But I mean, if I just look through this this timeline that I put together of her life and her writings, I think it becomes really clear that writing is how she, one, makes sense of the world. And two, her most, I don't want to say frenzied, but her most prolific times in her life when she's producing the most work uh, is when she's she has undergone some sort of crisis or is facing some kind of difficulty this happens after her conversion it also happens uh after the suppression of the worker priests in which she writes this very measured kind of letter to them uh talking about obedience and kind of how they fit into the larger ecclesial structure and you know what the purpose of of their mission is and was um yeah so i to me, it looks like she really needs to write almost. Uh, they say that her her breviary was full of little notes, like so many, so that she called it, what is she, she called it an herbier in French. I don't know, like a, yeah, anyway, like a garden full, full, yeah, of, yeah. full of things. And um, the other thing I would say is after she discerned away from working in the communist government, that is when she really starts writing a lot for publication and becomes a very sought after writer. So I think that it wouldn't be wrong to infer that at that point, she discerned that her vocation was to writing. Yeah. So even, and, and when I say vocational mission, I don't mean necessarily even writing for other people. I just meant that yeah. she clearly had this need to put into writing into words what she was experiencing in prayer mm -hmm. internally. And I, I get the sense that that's almost as much for her benefit as for anybody, anybody I else's. So. I yeah. mean, and, I, and I think this bears, 
repeating in our age. And I hope I'm not just showing myself to be an old fuddy duddy. And well, in my day, we, we wrote all the time, you know, but in this day and age of digital this and digital that we're, we're, we, we read a lot in terms of online things, so forth, but have we, have we lost the art of words? We are linguistic creatures and poetry is so important because it reminds us of the power of words to put into a concrete expression, an internal thought, mood, feeling, disposition, subjective experience, and to externalize it in some way so that you can then, in some sense, objectify it, look at it, take it like a diamond and twist it and look at its various facets. Yeah. That is the power of writing. That's right. And I, 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 it comes through in her, when you read her stuff, you realize this is a woman who knew how to put into words what was in her prayer. Mm hmm. You and know, and I mean, not just her prayer, like we've talked a lot about the poetry, but but her thought too. her thought, her philosophy. It, she is a woman. I mean, you might not think this of a poet, but she's a woman of remarkably precise ideas when you read her stuff like, you know, yeah. the Marxist city is mission territory or whatever. She's. But don't you think that's all of a piece, the prayer, the thought? Oh, I do. The poetry, I do. Of course. You know, uh, yeah, and that's yeah. kind of what I'm. But I, I know what you mean, that she yeah. was not just all lyricism. She no, was right. she was she mm -hmm. could be quite precise. Yeah. And incisive and to the point. And like and still beautiful and while being incisive and to the point. Yeah. It's just she's so good. It's dazzling is the I mean, word and for it. and if you if you don't read French and if all you encounter of hers is is the English translation, I mean that like no offense to the translator, but it, it, it still it pales in comparison to the original as any translation does. Um so I mean if she's this powerful to you in English, just imagine how powerful she would be if it was your native language. Oh, I'm going to have to brush up on my French now. Uh, Thank you so much, Colleen. <laughs> Probably running I'm, out of time. I, I was going to add one thing if we're not running out sure. of time. But, no, but, you add one more thing. There is no running out of time. It's just the but, sort of internal clock in my own head about the attention span of myself hmm. and others. You know, I was just but thinking anyway. about her, her writing style. You know, it's very, she's extremely uh, synthetic and concise. Yeah. And, um, and she uses, I mean, like like any good poet, really, she uses a lot of images, actually, like Jesus himself, uses images from everyday life, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that actually is of a piece with her theological project, in a way. Um, because, well, I would say that her, her theology is sort of the theology of, well, you can't say it's the theology of everyday, everyday life, but it's the spirituality of the kind of the glory, the poten potentially the glory of everyday life when it's animated by, by Christ, you know? And um, I read an essay a couple of months ago by a, a professor at Hillsdale named Dwight Lindley, and he has a theory of a, it's a, it's a Trinitarian theory of, of literature, of poetry, essentially. And basically, he says that in, in, in literature, you have a speaker, an I, you have, uh, you have another, the thing being talked about, but an, uh, and then you have the reader. Uh, as well and then but then you also have all the images and metaphors that are being used to communicate all this so you actually you had this, this, this kind of community this experience of community which he thinks is, is linked to the, it's a trinitarian kind of analogy of uh, it's, it's, yeah. it's an analogy for the trinity and i think that in madeline um you have the way that she brings in these images from everyday life these things that we wouldn't even we would ignore you know if she didn't draw our attention to it um, it's actually a way of recharging um, creation, the apparently dull creation with like with that original creative energy of, of God. But, I mean, because, you know, behold, I make all things new. You know, I think that that's very much of a piece with her, her spiritual project. Well, which... that's it. That's kind of what I was trying to say. So thank you for saying it, because, yeah, that uh, the word goes out and, it, and it's fruitful and uh, fruitful in ways that we don't even and can't even predict in you know in our tiny little ways anyway does anybody want to add one last thing before we uh sign off today colleen shaking her head no I've said it all it's all been said <laughs> go read madeline that's all i'm saying go lead madeline go read madeline del Brel. absolutely and i would encourage people to do so well thanks everybody for listening I, big i thought this was a fantastic conversation it reminded I, me of our old reading group Amen. Well, see, thank you for saying that, because uh, I used to 
my colleague and I, Dr. Rodney Hauser, used, and I used to run communio study circles in mm -hmm. one yes. of our houses when I still taught at DeSales. And we'd get 40, 50 students showing up routinely jammed into our living rooms. And it would just be, it would just start off with Hauser or me or one other professor expos expositing this very dense communio theological article. And we didn't pull any punches. And the goal was to eventually just have it turn into a conversation, mm -hmm. a kind of study circle conversation. And inevitably it did. And you'd be there, you'd talk for three hours then as the, as the room would catch fire. And I've tried to model my podcast kind of on that. That's why I don't like to script it too much in advance. I just like to let it be a conversation. So, and I thought this was a good one. I thought it was a very good one. So Thank both of you. Uh, thank you both of you for, for coming here today and talking about Madeline. And I hope all my uh, listeners and viewers uh, would run out and purchase them from Ignatius Press. <laughs> there we go. The dazzling light of God. And what's the other one again that I just ordered? The Holiness of Ordinary People. The Holiness of Ordinary People. I've conversed with Thomas J Jacoby before because of my work with Ignatius Press, but Colleen, this is my first encounter with you, and I have to say it was utterly delightful. It's so a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for coming on, and thank you, everybody, for listening. <laughs>